Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 217th video cast podcast for the week ending December 14th, 2023. Uh, we'll do some quick photos and then we'll get right down to it. Got a ton of incredible stuff to cover today. So, first and foremost, uh, we were up in Boston this weekend for a uh, major swim meet. Um, and uh, let's see, Annabelle was the 10 and under high point winner at the Charles River Invitational in Massachusetts this weekend. And Mimi qualified for Eastern Zone Championship in the 500 yard freestyle with a time of five, 539.36. Uh, so very, very exciting and very proud of them. That's Annabelle high point. And that is Mimi with her amazing coach uh connie and uh was just a great weekend and then saturday was a four-day meet so saturday i took mimi to brown for i believe it was an odp camp which is olympic development camp so that's her at brown university we had a fun day and that's my lefty champ which is a big deal in water polo if you're a lefty uh that's uh brown the bear at brown so that was pretty cool uh more lefty action controlling the point like a champ that was great uh this i don't think i shared with this when i did the uh, schwab network at the nyse oh wait no, no no this is fox business this is the amazing christmas tree in front of fox business with these little uh you know holiday uh people uh that's the news corp building i know some of you have seen this this is inside the green room this is also where gutfeld is recorded the studio that charles uses from one uh from monday through thursday the one on friday is uh in the other building but uh pretty exciting there so uh you know i know some of you like the the uh, behind the scenes views so i like to try and do that but uh this segment with charles i want to go into we cover three turnaround stocks general outlook we're going to go here Rid. all right my next guest says be long santa and short the Grinch. I'm going to bring in Great Hill Capital Chairman Thomas Hayes. All right, Tom. Tom. I mean, we got we got Santa. We got the Grinch. How do you go? How do you how you short the Grinch? Well, you keep staying long, and you continue to buy the, buy the dips, even if Chair Powell's a little hawkish tomorrow. You know he's going to come out. He keeps talking hawkish and acting dovish, and that's what we're going to see. We're going to get forward. back to that point then, because it wasn't uh, maybe a week or so ago when uh, Chair Powell made he read from the script, yeah. and the street interpreted it exactly the way he didn't want him to. Right? That was that day we had that big rally. We really haven't looked back since. And I remember we had a series of those kind of things happen, and then there was a, the, the big event in Wyoming where he dropped a hammer on us. Could, could Powell become frustrated with the fact that the street's not listening to him? As long as he doesn't say autopilot, we're going to be okay. <laughs> you know, the, the key here, I think the theme is broadening, okay? So moving forward, buy the dips, but where do you buy the dips? I love the chart you put out with the Magnificent 7 down and the rest of the market up. Uh, you look at uh, large caps training at 18.9 times forward, mid caps 13.9 times, small caps 13.2 times forward earnings. Right. So we want to look for the opportunity for outperformance in 2024, mid to small on a relative basis. One of the reasons I really love having you on the show is you bring ideas that uh, a few others do. Yes. Really, and, and one of them is they're kind of gutsy. Yeah. I mean, you, you do some serious bottom fishing, VF Corp. Yeah. VF Corp. I mean, you can see this chart, folks. This is from 2021. I mean, this bad boy is like, yeah, right? Uh, I had to do the sound effects for this one. But I can see, okay, you've got these key moving averages. Maybe it's formed support here. But you also like the fundamentals. Yeah. Well, they don't call me turnaround Tom for nothing. I always bring the turnarounds <laughs> for 2024. Uh, the key story here is new management change. Brack and Darrell, he came from Logitech. When he took over Logitech in 2013, the stock was down 82%. If you bought when he became CEO, you made a 26 bagger over the next eight years. You put five million in, you got $133 million back. He's back in, he just did his kitchen sink quarter. He's deleveraging the balance sheet. Vans is doing poorly. He got a new CEO, a new president of Vans. And this thing's gonna rip. He's gonna apply the EU stuff that's working for the North right. Face up 20%. He's gonna apply it in the US and he's gonna create a multi bagger. We, we did. A, I, I had the uh, pleasure of doing pretty good with that stock as yeah. well from time to time. I didn't hold it from beginning to end, but we did okay. Yeah. I got another sound effect for you down. Baxter again. 
since 2022 has been unmitigated. I guess they don't have any fat loss drugs. <laughs> That's right. It's the, it's the <laughs> antithesis of that. So this is sold off. It's down 65 percent uh, overhype on the GLP ones. All the medical devices were down. All the food companies were down. A lot of the staples were down. Uh, but the fact is they've doubled free cash flow year on year. Uh, they're turning it around. And, and here's the problem. They've historically traded at a 19 times PE. They're now trading at a 12 times PE. How are they going to solve that? They're going to spin off their slowest growing business, which is the kidney business, in the first half of next year. That's going to take the multiple back up to right. a normalized level re-rate. Plus, they sold off a business, uh, created $4 billion of cash. They're paying down debt. That's going to save $100 million. $180 million a year of interest expenses on an annualized basis. See, and the reason, again, I love that you come, you know, it's not it's just, you know, it's, it's fundamentals, yeah. it's oversold stuff, and I want to give you some props. September, early September, you gave a CCI right about here, and uh, this thing, the high 90s, been as high as $114 a share. This is a hell of a move already, but I think yeah. you're looking for more, right? Absolutely. Uh, Elliot Singer, uh, Singer came in, Paul Singer with Elliot Management, activist. They want, they said, he came in and he said, uh, excuse me, board, I'd like to fire you and I'd like to fire the CEO. <laughs> and by the way, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Uh, guess what? The CEO stepped down last week. The stock is up. This is a yield play as rates come down, REITs go up. They've got 45,000 cell phone towers. They're going to sell off the fiber and the small cell business, which is non-productive, the return on invested capital is going to go back to double digits, and this thing's off to the races. This can work its way back up towards 200 over the next two to three years. What's the yield right now, the dividend yield? Five and change. Wow. Yeah. Five and change and this much upside. That's right, exactly. really, really yeah, attractive. Thanks so much, Great, great stuff, Thomas. It. Appreciate it. All right, folks, coming up, how today's CPI data is going to affect tomorrow's rate decision. And, and we're back. So that was that. Then uh, the day before that, uh, that was Tuesday. I was at Yahoo at their brand new studios in the Vornado building. Amazing build out. And you can see here me standing in front of the glass studios. And I'm facing a bullpen of like, you know, 75 people that were in the office. Everyone was in the office, by the way. Uh, oh, by the way, we do have an update on Vornado, so we're, we're, we're not going to be talking uh, about Vornado as much moving forward. Uh, anyway, so let, let's do this. Uh, this is the control room. When you walk in, you can see all the action that's happening there uh, for the interviews. I mean, they just did a beautiful, beautiful job. There's Julie Hyman and Josh Lipton. Josh used to be on CNBC, if you remember. He was always from San Francisco. He just came over to Yahoo!, Julie Hyman was on Bloomberg. She's at Yahoo. She interviewed me for this segment. That's the cool Yahoo sign when you walk in, uh, et cetera. So we're, um, uh, by the way, uh, as far as Fox Business, I want to thank uh, Charles Payne, obviously, Kayla Aristivo, and Nick Palazzo. And for Yahoo, I want to thank Julie Hyman and uh, Sydney Freed for having me on. Bear with me, guys. I was up at three o'clock this morning to do CNBC Indonesia. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's been a long day. But nonetheless, uh, here we go. Uh, one stock we own and why and one to avoid was the theme of the segment. And here you are. Absolutely. This stock is down 65% since its 2021 high. It's down because of the Hillron, Hillrom acquisition. They used a lot of debt on that. It's underperformed expectations, but we're starting to see that turnaround. Margins are improving sequentially, so that's very good. Then they had the supply chain issues from COVID. Like all these companies, they built up their inventory tremendously at high cost. They've been working through that inventory for the last two quarters. So we're starting to see the margin expansion there. And then, of course, the GLP-1 fears. That was the final nail in the coffin. You saw it on the yeah. uh, lower, lower right side of that chart. Yeah, we can take uh, it back for a real quick. Yeah, and then look you at see this it. right here. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, that was when there. everyone was saying, everyone's going to lose weight. No one is ever going to get a medical uh, procedure again <laughs> because we're going to be healthy. But the problem is, even if they're correct and we lose all that weight, we all go out and play pickleball. And we have knee problems. We have shoulder problems. We have hip problems. We play golf. We get more active. So uh, those are the three reasons that it's down. We think the valuation is tremendous here, which right. uh, goes to our next point. Yeah. So let's talk about the valuation a little bit. Valuation and performance, as you point out. And you're looking specifically at the price to sales ratio as a measure of valuation. Obviously, you've seen that come down also. Yeah. It's trading at 1.2 times sales. This is very, very low historically and just absolutely. Uh, it's also trading its historic PE multiple, price to earnings multiple, uh, historically has been about 19 times because this 
has been a grower. This business has compounded capital, return on invested capital of double digits for decades now. So this is a proven business, but the PE multiple is trading down to 12 times next year's earnings uh, in opposition to its average multiple of 19 times. Uh, and that's largely due to the kidney business. The renal care business is mm -hmm. the slowest growth division, uh, and they're going to spin that out to shareholders. So, gotcha. So uh, you that, think that should unlock some value. And just yeah. to point out to our viewers, this is about, I think, a 10-year chart here, or nearly so. So it shows you definitely over the long term just how low that price-to-sales ratio is on a comp, um, comparative basis. And so you mentioned one potential catalyst for recovery. That is the spin-off of that renal business. Yeah. What are some of the other potentials? Well, uh, a couple of things. First off, they sold off the biopharma business. That They got $4 billion of that. So that's going to help them deleverage. That's been a weight, the interest expense. That's going to take about $180 million a year of interest expense out of the business. Mm. The key thing about that renal care spin is that once you take the slowest growth division out of the equation and that spun to shareholders, what's remaining, Baxter Co., uh, Remain Co., uh, that's going to start to trade re-rate at a higher multiple because it has a higher growth rate. Management is pers uh, expecting prospectively that it's going to grow revenues at 4 to 5 percent. The margins are improving sequentially as we work through the supply chain issues. So we really like the story. We think Baxter can work its way back to $60 over the next 12 to 24 months. So it's a longer term play. Gotcha. There'll be some bumps in, a ro in the road along the way, but we do think the GLP hype is a little overblown here. Okay, so what we like to ask people what the biggest risk then is for that bullish case here. And you're saying maybe it has to do with pricing power. Yeah, I think you know management has in their assumption of the long-term top line growth rate of four to five percent that they're going to have some pricing power and the risk to that is they have competition that has have similar products out there and they don't innovate quickly enough but uh, they've shown a track record of innovation even on the pharma side with their launches uh, their injection business etc so we're pretty confident that this is not going to come to bear mm -hmm. but it's something to keep in mind as a risk okay so that's your goodbye looking yeah. at this whole weight loss universe yeah. let's talk about the stock you're saying adios to yeah. in this scenario and that is eli Lilly which is your goodbye in this scenario. So let's walk through the thesis on this one. You say it's already priced for perfection, so right. maybe not a lot of room for error. That's correct. One. So it's priced in a lot of really, really good news. Uh, it's historically traded at, at about uh, 27 times earnings. It's mm -hmm. trading at 48 times next year's earnings. Uh, as opposed to Baxter, which is trading at 1.2 times sales. This is trading at 15 times sales. This is unprecedented. You're paying for fift not 15 years of profits. You're paying for 15 years, basically, of revenue. Uh, and uh, we understand the growth. We understand the valuation. But this has really just gotten too ahead of itself even if you believe all the good things are going to happen. Right, and we should just mention there actually happened to have been some news today yeah. on Eli Lilly, ZepBound, which is their specific weight loss drug that is the uh, basically counterpart to Manjaro, the, yeah. uh, the uh, diabetes drug. There was a new study that came out and said people who were on it, once they were off it for a year, they gained back half of their weight. Yeah. Now, they're still a lot lighter than they used to be, but nonetheless, that was hitting the stock a little bit in yeah. today's session. So just something to think about as well for folks. So competition with lower prices is one of the other things that you're looking yeah. at. Here. Expectations are these type of drugs, the GLP ones. Uh, number one, you got to pay the thousand or fourteen hundred dollars a month, or it starts to come back, uh, both on this one and we've, we, you know, it's expected on the other ones. Uh, but it's expected that the price of these drugs is going to uh, erode from 14000 a year down to 3000 a year mm. over the next decade, uh, and it's going to become a Me Too product. There are already multiple companies that make similar drugs, right. so there's going to be more and more enter the fray. Well, and then there's the question of, okay, and who is exactly is going to pay for it when you're looking at this thing? Let's go here. So, in other words, is insurance going to cover it? Yeah, and, and so far the jury is still out because if you look at the excess cost of a diabetic, is about nine thousand dollars a year for the insurance companies. Right now, some of these top tier drugs are fourteen to eighteen thousand dollars a year. So the math equation doesn't work just yet. That might get better. But best case scenario, they're expecting the analysts, and you, and you heard before, about 15% of the morbidly obese people will be on it within 10 years. So that's a kind of a relatively small portion of the population. If you think about the top 10% of households, 190,000 of income, if they're self-payers, $14,000 a year is a lot of money. It, yeah. you know, and what about the other 90% of the population that may need it? Yeah, okay. So what could go right for Eli Lilly and therefore wrong for your thesis here? If we can get that to come up, I think we're a little fro. Oh, there we go. Insurance coverage begins to accelerate. Yeah, I, I think uh, as the costs come down, the, the equation may improve for insurance companies to start to cover. They may say, if we put them on this at 
5,000 a year, 7,000 a year, we're gonna have to pay for a lot less procedures down mm. the road as their health gets better. Um, the other thing is they have uh, an Alzheimer's drug that, that's uh, expected to be approved. Right. Maybe the results will be better than expected. That could be a, a complete game changer. Uh, so there are some positive catalysts here, certainly that uh, uh, could change this thesis. And, and we do think it's gonna con continue to put out great products. Uh, it's just we're not willing to pay this current okay, price. Okay, and just quickly, do you, do you have positions in either Baxter or Lilly? We own Baxter, we have no position in Lilly. And we're back. Um, and then these were the New York Stock Exchange photos. I don't think I got a chance to share them uh, from when I was on Schwab Network. Uh, that's an amazing Christmas tree in front of NYSE. I mean, there's nothing like New York City during the holidays. That's uh, the CNBC, um, Mike Santelli back there. And then uh, more tree, more tree. Uh, that's um, Nicole Petalides, who I was on her show. That was the person who was on right before me. Uh, and I think that's it for that. And then finally, we had, uh, uh, we also had um, last night, everyone loves Phil Yin from CGTN, as well as I want to thank Phil and I want to thank Mona Zugby been a busy week. Um, oh, that explains why, because it's not here. Okay, so we're going to go ahead. I'll just show you this one. Hedge fund tips. There we go. And here it is. Phil Yen and Mona Zugby. So um, uh, this one was all about the Fed the inflation, the outlook, et cetera, and everyone loves uh, Phil's back and forth, so here we go. For more on uh, the economy and reaction, Thomas Hayes, uh, we need him badly for this, uh, founder, chairman, managing member of Great Hill Capital. Good to see you. If, um, if, if you're piloting the plane and the Fed says what they said, are you pushing all the engines now forward at maximum speed because there really isn't anything to worry about? The Fed just gave you uh, the biggest green light you're ever going to get. Yeah, no question. I mean, what a difference a few weeks makes. Uh, you know, I've been uh, very constructive on the economy uh, and markets in particular going into year end. But on October 22nd, there was a major headline in the Wall Street Journal that said, quote, another Black Friday may be uh, another Black Monday may be around the corner. And I made a joke of that uh, publicly. I said, well, there's only two Monday's left in the month of October, so they've got a 50-50 shot. And uh, sure enough, here we are at all-time highs in the Dow. The Fed did, in fact, give the green light, but I think you have to be nuanced where you go chasing. And, and uh, you can chase the higher-priced, high-multiple large-cap stocks, or you can find incredible bargains in the mid-cap and small-cap that are trading at much lower valuations. I, I, I love it. Look, anybody watching the show is, is probably a normal investor, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and if you're a normal person, you have what we call FOMO, which is you've been worried in January, you've been worried in February, you were... You made excuses why you weren't going to buy certain things or certain sectors. And then you, you mentioned October where it got a little bit scary. But here we are. You've missed out probably on a lot of gains. And you've got three weeks left in December. And, and we all know what the answer is. When you're scared of missing out and you get greedy, you're going to buy almost everything. What are we buying? Okay. So I would suggest being nuanced. Actually, Earlier this week, two days ago, uh, the market was up and all, basically all of the Magnificent Seven were down. That is a sign of broadening. That's very healthy. That's what you see in a bull market. Uh, when you have very narrow leadership, it's not the best scenario. Now that we have the broadening happening, uh, large cap is trading at 19 times next year's earnings, a little bit above average, the historic average. Mid caps are trading at 13.9 times next year's earnings and small caps are trading at 13.2. So we're focused on turnaround plays. They don't call me turnaround Tom for nothing, Phil. Uh, <laughs> we like uh, VF Corp is a company that we own and the reason we bought it, they have North Face, Timberland, Vans, 
Supreme, Dickies. It's fallen 85% from its pre-pandemic highs. They just got a new CEO. He did his first quarter, the kitchen sink quarter. His name is uh, Bracken Darrell. He came from Logitech. When he joined Logitech, the stock was down 82% in 2013. Over the next eight years, B, right, BF, it. right? That's your turnaround play. What VF Corp? What, yeah. what what happened to the jobs? What happened to the college uh, payments that were due? And we're all supposed to be saving money, and consumer stocks were getting hammered. All those discretionary stocks, including the one you just mentioned, are all part of a giant basket that everybody was worried about. What happened? What happened is you can never count out the U.S. consumer when they have a job, and somehow. Jay Powell has navigated the, uh, the holy grail, the uh, immaculate disinflation, where he was able to bring down inflation without destroying the jobs market. And when Americans have jobs, they spend money, period, over and out, never bet against that. And then what's this about these, these uh, two rate cuts that the Fed is, quote, hinting at because of the, the dot plot? I don't want to get too technical here, but the bottom line is the expectation now is for at least two rate cuts in 2024. What is that yeah. going to depend on? I, I guess you're obviously, if you're bullish, you're betting on that, if not more. But how should the average investor view this? I'm bullish and I'm betting on less than that. So they've got three in the dot plot for next year. And then they've got some more in 2025, expecting uh, the Fed funds rate to be down to 3.6% by 2025. Uh, end of 2025. I'll take the over on that. I don't think they're going to need to cut as much as they think. I do think this, the economic engines are humming. Uh, and after maybe a couple of cuts, it might be a mid-cycle type of situation like 1995, where they can just let the economy run and, and they're not going to have to take rates down as aggressively as the market is pricing at the moment. In, in, in other uh, words, if the, if the economy is strong, why do they need to cut, right? I mean, the, the whole purpose of cutting is that if you need to stimulate the economy, but if the economy is, is on fire, it doesn't make sense that the Fed would, would, would cut. Am I well, reading that correctly? Yeah, there is a lag effect. So they don't want to be too aggressively restrictive, particularly in the face of inflation coming down, which we saw in the PPI, which is a better forward indicator than CPI, which is kind of uh, backward looking. PPI is a leading indicator. So I think they just want to get ahead of because deflation is a much harder problem to solve than inflation. Inflation, we know what we have to do. Deflation can last for many, many years, as we've seen throughout the world over the last few decades. So I think what they're saying is we're on it. We're not going to let uh, too much disinflation kick in. We will be at the wheel and, uh, and the economy's fine. Jobs are, are fine. The economy's strong. Earnings are expected to go 12% 12, 12 next year. And by the way, the most important thing is uh, all these CEOs were prepared for a recession that never came this year, so they cut costs. They were, I, they were very is. conservative, and margins are expected to go up 60 basis points next year, expanding it, it, margins. If, if you read the headlines from this year, you would have hid in the corner, and, and this is an incredible turnaround. Uh, that's why I guess uh, we can call you turnaround, Tom. I, had, I think you had a pretty good year this year. Uh, I'll see you soon, yeah, Tom. Thank sure. you. Sure. Thanks so much, Phil. Uh, in other news. And we're back. So that was CGT in America. And then finally, this morning, I was had the privilege to be on CNBC Indonesia with uh, Maria Katerina. Thanks to Maria and Fitria Angrani, all about the Fed. Here you go. Bersama dengan Chairman and Managing Member Great Hill Capital, Thomas J. Hayes. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Maria. Great to be with you. Yeah, great to see you. Uh, Indonesian market has a, a give uh, get back uh, early uh, Christmas grief from the Fed after the Fed decide to hold interest rates. Uh, how uh, will the U.S. market respond? So Wall Street uh, and then Dow Jones Index are reportedly having a big uh, because of it. Thomas. Yeah, well, Maria, uh, Chairman Powell achieved something that no one thought he would be able to do. We call it the immaculate disinflation. He was able to bring down inflation without uh, destroying the jobs market. And now that he's done his dovish pivot uh, towards cuts, the market has really taken out off with the Dow Jones hitting all-time highs <laughs> at 37,000. I think moving forward, we'll continue to see gains uh, through year-end. Santa Claus will come to town, a Santa Claus rally. But the opportunity now is, is looking at those stocks that have been left behind, because a lot of our gains in the U.S. in the first 
you know, seven or eight months have been driven by tech, large cap tech. Uh, but the S&P, the large cap index is trading close to 19 times next year's earnings. We want to focus on the mid cap index, which is trading at only 13.9 times forward earnings, or even the small cap index trading at 13.2 times next year's earnings. That's where the, the bargains are going to be as this rally broadens mm. out to more and more stocks participating moving forward. Mm. Okay, uh, Thomas, the VAT also hint uh, at cutting interest rate two times uh, next year's, and uh, when do you think? When do you think that the VAT uh, will start lowering interest uh, rates? Many predict April or May. What about your predictions? Yeah, looking at the dot plot, it looks like it could start as early as March. Uh, it was uh, unexpected that the Fed would acknowledge that they're going to cut three times next year. The Fed funds future have now started to price in double that. Uh, so the Fed funds futures move from four, four cuts expected next year to six cuts. Uh, so I think we could start to see a 25 basis point as quickly as March. Uh, if not March, then May for sure. And uh, it could be back to back. Uh, so they are they have definitely pivoted and it was a unanimous unanimous decision. So expect easing in, in the first half this, uh, of 2024. Mm -hmm. So what are the United States economic conditions uh, right now that will make the Fed start lowering interest rate? Yeah, well, I think the the next key data point is going to come next week uh, with the Fed's favored uh, inflation, core PCE. And the expectations is that the core PCE will be at 2.3%. Uh, that would be down from 3.7%. Uh, I think that, you know, once you start to see 2.3%, uh, you're getting really close to the target. Uh, that's what the Fed wants to see, and that should give them the green light to, to start to cut uh, at least one cut in the first half of next year. Mm -hmm. So for the first interest rate cut, how big do you predict uh, it? Uh, how, how, how big do you predict the drop will be? Yeah, I, I think they're going to stick with the 25 basis point cuts, mm -hmm. do a cut, see how the market responds, see how the economy responds, see how inflation expectations respond. And uh, and if they're successful with that, that will be the path that they follow. Not only are they expecting down to 4.6 percent by the end of 2024, but they actually guided to 3.6% by the end of 2025. Mm -hmm. So they are anticipating uh, more cuts than maybe just two weeks ago that they were anticipating. Okay, well, even though it has signals of reductions in interest rates, the Fed also warned uh, that if forced to reduce inflation to the 2%, target will change and a word still uncertain. Does that mean that next year's the interest rate will definitely decrease, or will it remain at the two percent inflation standard? If it's not already two percent, won't the interest rate uh, go down? Yeah, I think at this point they they acknowledge they have a dual mandate. Number one is maximum employment, and number two is price stability. So so long as inflation stays in line, I think they will cut because they don't want to see unemployment spike higher. And there is a lagged effect of all the tightening that they've done in the last year and a half. So I think they want the landing to be soft or no landing at all. And that's going to require at least a couple of cuts to, to smooth things out after such aggressive tightening, provided that uh, their favorite gauge like uh, core PCE continues to stay subdued and inflation expectations continues to stay subdued. If those two things remain in place, mm -hmm. uh, they'll continue forward with the, uh, the path of cuts. Well, moving on to the in the midst of global uh, uncertainty, what are the main challenges and uh, issue that the Fed will pay attention to in uh, deciding uh, its policies? Yeah, I, th I think uh, first and foremost is going to be the inflation numbers. Uh, that's that's number one to them, core PCE. They'll pay attention to job openings, which have been falling, which they like to see. Um, uh, and they're going to look at average hourly earnings. Those are kind of the three key things that they're going to keep on their radio, obvi radar. Obviously, they've got to keep an eye on energy 
They've got to keep an eye on ge geopolitical uh, issues that could impact energy. But leaving that aside, uh, I think all the numbers that are uh, of their purview are moving in the right direction and gives them the green light to move ahead with some level of normalization and easing in the first and, and second half of next year. Okay. Uh, after uh, the Fed has a plan to cut rates until three times next year, so what are your predictions for United States economic growth in 2024? It will uh, grow aggressively enough for uh, next year's or just uh, conservative? Yeah. yeah, we have a perfect combination. Earnings are expected to grow 12% next year. Uh, which uh, no one was anticipating uh, just a few months ago. So, so estimates have continued to hold in high and actually start to move up. That's number one. And number two, margins are actually increasing. Uh, margins are expected to go up uh, 70 basis points in, in 2024. And that's because you had all these CEOs preparing for a recession that never came in 2023. And now they've got the cost cuts in place. They're running efficiently and uh, and the ec economy is turning up. So all of this points to a very, very positive uh, 2024, both economically and also constructively for uh, U.S. indices. And, and just to look at, uh, we saw a weakening of the dollar, which is going to uh, it's the weakest since it's been since August. That's going to help multinationals with their earnings as well on the foreign exchange. So mm -hmm. a lot of things are pointing in the right direction for 2024. Well, thank you, Thomas G. Hayes, Chairman and Managing Member, Great Hill Capital. Thank you for your time to discuss with us and thank you for your insight to us. Have a good day. And we're back. Finally, want to thank um, Reuters for including me in the response to the jobs report last week. That was great. And let's move on here. The quotes of the week I want to cover, all of which are very, very important, are Buffett. Whether we're talking about socks or stocks, I like buying quality merchandise when it's marked down. That's been the theme of this since day one. Uh, if you, and then here's Charlie Munger. If you buy something because it's undervalued, then you have to think about selling it when it approaches your calculation of intrinsic value. That's hard. But if you buy a few great companies, you can sit on your ass. Okay, you can sit on your ass. There's Charlie. That's a good thing. So a um, couple updates today. Uh, the market just absolutely ripped higher. Vornado was up 10%, um, uh, as was Intel in the morning. And, you know, we've talked about these for quite a while. Uh, Vernado, we were up uh, 2x plus, uh, 100 to 125% gains uh, since March. I mean, off the charts. Uh, some of the options were up as much as 450%, uh, 4.5x 4, 4 or 350%. So we took profits on Vernado. We bought the thing when no one wanted it in March. Uh, it was uh, trading at uh, 40 uh, 40 percent of book value. We sold it today just around book uh, value. I do think this will work a lot higher over time. I think it's run a lot in a short period of time and pigs get slaughtered. And I think there are cheaper things that are higher quality. I mean, they are the best assets in New York City. Uh, people are coming back to the office. Um, uh, but this is not a buy and hold forever. And we think uh, between the hybrid of what we gained on the op, some of the options were giving us credit for like 38 to $40. And we bought it, you know, depending on the account between 13 and 16. And it's been, you know, uh, eight, seven, eight, nine months. Uh, so uh, you got to ring the register. So we did made a lot of money on that. You guys were all part of it. Thank you. Uh, and then Intel, we could have kept a trailer on that, but we, we just decided uh, we want to have some cash. Um, and then Intel, um, Intel, you know, bought between 24 and 26. Uh, this thing has been a beast. It's run straight up. And what we figured out today, uh, same type of story. We had some options on it, depending on the account, at up uh, 3.5x. Uh, you know, in, in some cases in less than a year, seven, eight, nine months, some cases about a year. Uh, and near, you know, uh, Vornado was uh, more than a double, um, uh, you know, 125% on the stock, you know, 225, 2.25x. Um, Intel 
was almost a double, a little bit less than a double from 25, uh, but the options were giving us credit for it. So with, with some of the options up 3.5x, uh, uh, multi-bagger there and nearly a double on the stock in less than a year, we took profits. Uh, now, why did we take profits? Because as we said, it's predominantly a PC business and we believe, you know, they had the big conference today Stock was up huge in the morning, up to 47, and we're like, all right, we got to we we got to take some profits because more or less 95 to 100 percent of the PC business is now priced in, and that's the business that we can count on, and that's why we got into the stock. We did take all the options off. We took about 75 percent of the stock off at a, at a huge profit as well, uh, but we did keep 25 percent on because we do believe in Gelsinger and we do believe that he actually will deliver on this foundry business and on these advanced chips uh, and all the other things. So we did keep a good chunk of stock on, just like we kept a bit of Ro Ro uh, Rolls, Reese, Rolls Resources, uh, uh, Rolls Royce, uh, we kept a little bit on after we took profits from a quick 3X on that stock last week. Um, so we're going to keep a little trailer on Intel and a pretty big trailer for the future because we do think it can move a tremendous amount of higher. It's just moved a tremendous amount in a short period of time. And we want to free up some capital for uh, cheaper opportunities right now, uh, to put money to work. You know, if Intel drops back into the thirties, we may, we may put back on the full position, but, uh, uh, this was a win and we're going to, we're going to take them ring, 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 amazing stuff. Um, so look, the theme is the seeds planted in 2022 have blossomed hugely in 2023. Think Amazon, Google, semiconductors last fall when no one wanted them. We were pounding the table like crazy. Go back to our October notes and podcasts. Uh, and then the seeds that are, uh, have been planted and got super planted in the last you know, a couple of weeks, like nobody's business in the case of China and Baba, those are going to be the ones that are going to blossom like no one's business in 2024. So great seeds in 2022, huge rewards from them 2023, great seeds in 2023, huge rewards from them in 2024. Um, uh, and small caps and banks and, and all the things we've talked about planning and, you know, Stanley Black and Decker, blah, 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 you, you know, all the names. Um, okay, so, uh, is there anything else I wanted to say about that? No, but you know, you guys were along for the ride. Congratulations. And, uh, I, you will have a Merry Christmas because of that. And, uh, and I'm grateful because you invested the time and the whole thing. But, you know, when you're dealing with those type of trades that aren't, the most high quality businesses in the world. Uh, that's what Munger said. And we knew where we wanted to get out before we got in. And we knew that we'd want to, uh, on all three, Vornado, Intel, uh, um, Rolls Royce, et cetera. Uh, and we knew which ones we wanted to keep a trailer on for really great things to come, which we've done. And we may, we may add back if the market uh, serves it up, but we're completely happy to um, uh, participate in the way that we have left on uh, on those. Okay, so I uh, got all the thank yous. All right, let's move on to, uh, I love this, Seth Klarman. We covered this last week, but he said, sometimes buying early on the way down looks like being wrong, but it isn't. You know, we, you know, some of the um, Vornado stock we bought in the high teens and some we bought in the low teens. Uh, same with Intel, some we bought in the high 20s, some we bought in the low 20s, but it gets you to an amazing average. Uh, and, um, and it's, you know, just the same across the board. Uh, you know, Cooper, the whole, the whole, the whole story. All right. Um, and we went through that great example on Meta last week, which, uh, if you didn't listen to that, go ahead and check it. This is the S&P chart. As great as this run has looked like we have run so much in such a short period of time. If you zoom out, which we talk about a lot on this, this is a chart from uh, Bank of America and Bloomberg. 
kind of looks like we're forming what they call a cup and handle. So you had the huge move off the 20 COVID lows. Uh, now we've spent two years consolidating sideways with basically no gains. The measured move on this, when you have these cup and handles, implies that uh, this market can move up to 5,600. And if you listen to Yardeni on Charles Payne before I was on the show on Tuesday, uh, he was calling for uh, S&P 6,000 by 20, end of 20, 2025. Uh, and that's in line with this measured move to the 5,600 plus. Election years for an incumbent tend to be pretty good. Uh, from the general indice standpoint, I don't think it'll be as good as this year. From the under the surface, non-magnificent seven, I think it'll be one of the best years ever. Small caps, banks, emerging markets, those are the themes for 2023 dollar weakening, 2024 dollar weakening. And I think that the tech, you know, we haven't sold our Amazon, we haven't sold our Alphabet, but I think they're gonna do less well. They're gonna be slower movers probably slightly less than the general indices, high single digits to uh, mid-teens max uh, for an election year. You figure 12 to 15% range. Um, I think 8 to 12 is better. But under the surface, the small cap catch up, which won't move the needle on the indices, mid caps, uh, some of these turnaround stories that uh, have low weightings in the indices are going to rip doubles and plus, and all these seeds are going to be monster crops in 2024 so we're excited but just looking forward if you think you missed anything you're, you're really going to miss it if you miss 2024 because then you, you, you've missed everything uh but this is really just getting ready to launch and uh even more so you'll see the small caps and the hang sang which we're going to co cover in a minute uh they're just coming off the mat like it's like buying at the pandemic lows if you feel like you missed it uh you're, you're really going to miss it if you miss this up this is going to be one of the greatest as amazing as 2023 was wait until these things play out in 2024 the indices are going to be like you know snore and like it's going to be like cooper standard it's like everyone always asks me about alibaba and, and like you, you we've had like you know uh, a negative contributor with Alibaba and everything else is like up multiple multi baggers all day long and all anyone wants to talk about is Alibaba and um but that's you know that, that that's the joke right you know everyone uh <laughs> focuses on everything that's worked it's just what hasn't uh but that'll be the opposite story in 2024 um you know when uh, everyone will have missed it because they sold in the hole in the 70s and 80s just like they did with semiconductors and tech last year uh and it's just the way the game works uh we wish it were different wish it were easier but uh it is what it is now oh and biotech by the way i mean unbelievable these things uh by and i said when it comes it comes all at once baba and biotech have done nothing for a year and a half they've just been grinding sideways wasting our time talking about it while while we got all these other things going that were like doubles triples uh and no one cares about them but these two are going to be beasts in 2024 and I'm, I'm grateful that everything else did so well that we could rebalance and get huge exposure to them going into 2024 where um i'm so excited for uh what's going to take place there but they're they're already starting to outperform the biotech and we'll see the others uh soon enough uh this is interesting this is from uh goldman sachs and it talks about some people are like nervous like well if if the fed's cutting rates doesn't that mean bad things are happening um that is recency bias from the 2000s if you go back before them 95 and the best example uh 80 to 82 if you're cutting in a reset if it's recessionary cuts you get bad market outcomes if it's expansion cycle cuts you get great outcomes 80 to 82 you cut from the peak that's probably the best analog uh set the stage for an 18-year bull market rally I think we're halfway through the secular bull. We've got another, you know, through the end of the decade, early into next decade, before the millennials turn 41, and then uh, demand will wane and we'll have, you know, corrections uh, along the lines of what you saw in 2000. Um, uh, but that's, you know, eight years off. We've got huge, huge runway. These are expansionary cuts. You'll see that as that plays out. Then you had uh, weekly advanced decline. You're seeing breath when breath uh, expands. Uh, this is on a global basis. Great things happen. You can see it coming out of the um, 
uh, financial, great financial crisis in uh, 2009 that led the way for multi-year bull. Then after the debt crisis in uh, EU debt crisis in 11 and 12, multi-year bull. Then after the 15, 16 stuff with China. By the way, the last time we had this many outflows, institutional outflows in China um, was uh, 2016. Oh, gosh, where is that chart? Um, I don't know why that one is not up. Okay, so I'm gonna actually show it to you here. Uh, let's see, here we go. I'm gonna show it to you on my phone because I can't pull it up fast enough on the Twitter. All right, it's not coming up, let's see. Okay, so here it is. Okay, so I put this out. And what you can see here is that the last, see those red bars there? There you go. The last time you had that much institutional outflows, look at the blue line on the Alibaba chart, was 2016, and that straight up, Alibaba basically went from 79 to 211 over the next 18 months after you had the outflows, after pessimism got that bad. Those of you who weren't around in 15 and 16, it was like the end of the world in China, exactly like it is right now. Look at those outflows. Look at the line, the blue perpendicular line and what happens to Baba. I mean, it's, it's just, and you were just in the same doldrums. It's just mind boggling. So, um, so that's what we have to look forward to in 2024. And this expanding breath is exactly what happened also in uh, after the 2015 and 2016 China debacle, uh, and you were off to the races. Uh, same thing coming out of COVID, the expansion, and just now coming out of uh, the 2022 tech and crypto sell-off uh, off to the races. So all of these things are pointing to good things. And then for autos, for Cooper Standard, uh, this came from my buddy over at Morgan, Stanley and um, Art Jonas uh, wrote this. The US SAR 2024 forecast, we're starting to knock on the door. We're coming off the flat line here last year when we bought Cooper Standard uh, at 550. And now you got SARS starting to knock on the door of pre pandemic levels 2017 when it was at uh, you know about 17 million. Uh, the bull case for next year is 16.5 million. The base case is 16 million and the bear case is 15. I think it's going to be closer to the bull case, uh, which means like what I said, if we can get to 85% of 2017 production, I think they can get over five, six, seven dollars a share. Then it's just going to be a question of the multiple trough multiple of 10, peak multiple of 20. Uh, and uh, that's going to be more harvest from the seeds planted in 2022 and a number of seeds planted in 2023. If you remember, the stock got down to $12 for a minute uh, and we were able to jump on it uh, with uh, new clients took advantage of that. So pretty exciting. All right, some stuff from my buddy over at RBC. Uh, Slumer is the author, Robert, and uh, thanks to my buddy who sent it over. Uh, so you can just zoom out, get a better view as as much as it looks like we're ripping the face off. We are just, you know, cup handle, just starting to break through and uh, going to see that. Oh, there's that um, um, similar chart. This is the uh, performance of the S&P versus bonds starting to outperform again. And then um, cup and handle breakout measured move a lot higher. S&P Weekly, S&P Daily. Uh, what did I want to see here? Okay. Um, 
Dow Jones. Okay, Russell 2000. So Dow Jones broke out to new highs yesterday. Russell 2000, I think this is where enormous opportunity is for the next few years. Uh, position accordingly. I love this. And then the other place that there's enormous opportunity in my view, you look, Europe is just start getting ready to break out. Uh, XUS, Tokyo, Hang Sang, okay? Uh, you can't give this thing away. It's toward the bottom of the downtrend. It's going to break out and take off. You're going to watch. Just look at the dollar. I've been to this movie before. Look, just think about how negative was everyone in March when I was pounding the table on Vornado, okay? How negative was everyone last October when I was pounding the table on tech and semiconductors? Now you can't get enough of them, right? The same is going to be true with Hang Seng. And this is the last bargain left in the world, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, everything else has started to run. This is the last bargain. Uh, rates are rolling over, 10-year yields rolling over, dollars rolling over. Everything is coming into place as we had laid out according to plan. And even the loony is getting strong. And remember, everyone was laughing at me. I said, you want to be long the loony? All my buddies up in Canada. Uh, so there you go. Uh, oil, you can, everyone wanted it. And, and it's been the worst thing performance the last few weeks. I think it's probably getting ready for a bounce. Um, all right. Uh, so that's that. Moving on. Was there something else? Russell small cap again, 10-year yields. I mean, can you believe the 10-year yield broke down below four? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's exciting to see this stuff play out because you know what? When the whole world is against you and you're running into the fire and, uh, and getting criticized and then all of a sudden everything works out all at once, um, there's something to be said for that. And I think many of you listening to this are developing that uh, intellectual rigor and emotional discipline where you're going to be seeing many multi-baggers of your own uh, before long. So uh, here's from Timu, uh, article from Bloomberg, with those kinds of emotions, skeptics question whether the app's success is sustainable. Customers got hooked on scrolling through the app to find two cheap-to-believe bargains like a sonic toothbrush for $3.28 or an AirPod-like earbuds for $2.98, but take away the millions of dollars in subsidies and marketing, and will people stay? The tech industry is littered, littered with one-time wonders like Wish.com, Groupon, Pets.com that spent heavily on subsidies only to find they couldn't convert users into loyal customers. Timu may not be able to offer its current low prices indefinitely, which could result in the erosion of its key value proposition, which is something for nothing, my editorialization, wrote Morgan Stanley analysts, including Simeon Gutman in the recent report entitled The Timu Effect. The data could suggest Timu is burning through new shoppers without generating stickiness after in initial trials on the platform. There, there are signs Timu's growth could be short-lived. About 44% of its shoppers are spending less on the platform, while just 22 are spending more, according to surveys by Morgan Stanley, an indication it's burning through new deal-hungry shoppers without converting them into loyal customers. Timu shoppers skew female, young, and low income. More than half have annual incomes of less than $50,000, and 58% are younger than 45, according to the firm. T By the way, this is characteristic of all of these uh, crap things that burned out like Wish and uh, Groupon and everything else. Uh, Timu objected to any comparison with Wish.com, of course. The e-commerce sensation that became the most downloaded e-commerce app in the world in 2018 as it struck marketing deals with the Los Angeles Lakers and soccer World Cup players and then saw its revenue collapse after it pulled back on subsidies. Uh, you know, it's just like life. How you start out in a relationship is how you end up. And, um, you know, you got to set the boundaries. And what they're doing is they're training people, give me stuff for free. And the minute they stop getting stuff for free, they're going to be gone. And that business is going to collapse. Our platform and supply chain are distinctly different from those of Wish.com, the company said in its statement, adding it can substantially offer low prices by cutting out middlemen between producers and consumers. Isn't that always the story? All right, moving right along. Crown Castle CEO to step down amid Elliott pressure shares gain. Um, so uh, we're getting some uh, wind behind our sales. We're, we're early to the party on these and then other people see the value and give us a little bit of help. Walt Disney, 
Uh, earnings power, the most important driver of shares in coming years, Morgan Stanley. They raised the price target to 110. Whoop de doo. Um, Nelson Peltz was out today with his proxy fight, so they're going to have to move fast to get these initiatives in place. China vows to boost domestic demand and bid for 2024 recovery. It grew 5% in 2023. So I don't know. Yeah, it's so funny. We're pointing fingers uh, when we're going to grow like at half the pace, but nonetheless. Uh, and then guess what? Advanced Auto Parts got an activist pushed by uh, activists to move on the World Pack sale, which I've covered in some of my public TV appearances. Uh, I think I covered that on Charles Payne. So <clears throat> these guys are saying, hey, Legion Partners Asset Management is, you know, uh, rattling, the, uh, making some noise to uh, Shane O'Kelly, the new CEO, like, hey, I know you're saying you don't have to sell it and blah, blah, blah. Get it done. It's non-core. Use the cash. Return the cash to shareholders. Let's rock and roll. And um, uh, oh, and they're also they also happen to be in VF Corp. Uh, who are these guys? I should give them a call. Uh, sound like smart guys, <laughs> nonetheless. All right, JP Morgan calls Amazon and Alphabet its top picks for 2024 in a bet that mega, tech, mega cap tech rally will continue. Uh, <laughs> they've had huge gains. This is a sign of opinion follows trend, right? So they're going to downgrade the Chinese stocks that are down and they're going to upgrade what's up. Where were they on Meta last year when it was $88? Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't have any near term plans to sell them because they're just great quality long term businesses. And I want some exposure to Magnificent Seven. And I own them at such a low basis that it doesn't matter. But um, it's kind of comical. I think these are going to do fine, but they're going to underperform uh, where, what we're loaded up on. Uh, small, mid, emerging markets, et cetera, are going to be the name of the game. Biotech. Biotech deals are heating up. Why 2024 could be an even hotter for M&A. Remember, I've always talked about deals and drugs while it grinded sideways for a year. Well, now it's starting to take off and break out. Amen, holla, hallelujah, Wall Street Journal. It's biotech stocks. Time to shine. Opinion follows trend. Price goes up. Articles follow. Wait till the upgrades come. Biotech stocks undergo recovery after a year of wreckage. Wreckage. It's the same price it, it, it bottomed last May or last March. It retested it in October. It's basically gone nowhere for a year and a half. How is that wreckage? Oh, and by the way, it's starting to break out now, but it's the Financial Times. They always write that kind of no nonsense on their headlines. You just got to accept it. Fox Business, uh, Intel CEO touts AI everywhere initiative ahead of event. And that's why when the thing hit 47 this morning, I said, buy the rumor, sell the news. Uh, and that's, you know, cha-ching. Russell 2000 on, but we did kept, keep a trailer because we do believe in this guy. Uh, Russell 2000 on pace for best month versus S&P in nearly three years. Okay, and the article of the week, how it started. <laughs> Remember, just October 22nd, this was our cover picture for our article of the week. Another quote, Wall Street Journal, Another Black Monday may be around the corner. And if you remember, my joke was, well, they've only got two Mondays left in October. So they, uh, you know, they got a 50-50 chance, like a coin flip. So that's how it started. Pessimism beyond belief, how it's going. All-time new highs on the, S on, the, uh, on the Dow Jones Industrial. So those are the TV things you did. Here's what the stock market looked like in October. Here's the blue box. Okay, it's taken off since. Here's what the bond market looked like. Taken off since. Here's what the dollar looked like. It was strong and it was the end of the world. It's rolled over. These, this is all we were talking about all October was buy stocks, buy bonds, short the dollar, and that was going to lead to an emerging market trade. So um, here's from September 21st. You can see this. Now the dollar's down to, I think, 96. So it collapsed down from there. Uh, here's bonds, the TLTs back up over uh, towards 100. Here was the commitments of traders, which we covered every week for like three weeks. I said, guys, gals, this is like 2018. Hedge funds haven't been this, this short bonds since the bottom before you had a monster rally. They are the dumb money. Look what's going to happen. And boom, bonds have absolutely ripped one of the biggest rallies in the shortest amount of time. And by the way, you'll get a pullback here, but just getting started, this is going to persist. I think you could probably go to 120 on the uh, 
TLT. So, um, and this was the, the article on September 28th. I said, this is gonna be another failed breakout, if you remember, when the 10-year yield was going to 5%. Now it's collapsed below four. Uh, it took us a couple more weeks than we expected, but that's the name of the game, October 4th. Uh, we talked about, you know, does this look like the end of the world? I was on the, the kayak in Portugal with my family. I was like, it's not the end of the world, ladies and gentlemen. There are opportunities. There's a pony in this pile I wrote on October 12th. Got to, got to dig in and, uh, and rock and roll. And then on the 19th, I talked about the only chart that matters was the bond chart. Didn't quite snap back yet. And now it's absolutely ripped from those low levels. And then finally, um, uh, the uh, another Black Monday may be around the corner headline, October 26th article uh, of the week. And then finally on October 31st, weak sisters flush stock market. And uh, that's when we talked about PayPal. Um, I laid out the case for why we own it. It was trading at 5140 that day. Uh, they've since reported results. So I wanna update the thesis. I think it's uh, over $60 now, maybe $62. But it really, $50, $60 doesn't mean anything. We're not in this for 20%. We're in this for doubles and triples. So, um, okay, so third quarter results. Remember, new CEO, big catalyst. The guy came from Intuit, ran the small business, which was half of the thing. Intuit was like a, one of the biggest multi-baggers of all time. You think Logitech was great with um, um, Brack and Daryl pales in comparison to what happened with Intuit with um, with Alex Chris. So here we go. Um, payment volume was up 15% uh, year on year. Uh, operating income, 4%. Uh, Non-GAAP was up 8%. And operating cash flow of 1.3 billion with free cash flow of 1.1 billion. There was an adjustment based on selling off the uh, buy now pay later in Europe to KKR. Bottom line is trailing 12 ballpark five billion dollars. They uh, are expected to buy. By the way, buy back a total of five billion dollars of stock in 2023. Return that to shareholders. They're growing revenues this year seven percent. And this is the turnaround year. This is not the growth year. You're going to see how many times this new CEO talks about this is a growth company. We will gain profitable revenue and we will do it now. This guy is no joke. I've never seen such an aggressive thing. He said the word we're going to win like 10 times in the conference call. This guy is a competitive beast. This is my kind of CEO. So, um, so there you go. Revenues, you can go through all this stuff. Uh, payment volumes up uh, mid-teens, net revenues up 8%. Margins were a little bit softish, but he explained why and how they're going to get it back. They fired a bunch of unprofitable customers in Southeast Asia and Latin America. They're like, get out of here. You're not making us money. We're only doing profitable growth going forward. Lean, mean, money-making machine. I uh, love that. Uh, Non-GAAP EPS up 20%. Okay, EPS was better than expectations. They raised guidance. Everything that you want to hear, they did. They've got $15 billion of cash. Uh, they reduced the share count this year by about 7%, 75 million shares. Um, so what else do you want to know? I mean, this thing is got the catalyst of a new CEO, the plan to get it done, increased guidance, beat on the results, plenty of cash, plenty of cash flow, Let's go through some more highlights here because we got a lot of AMA questions. Uh, payment volumes growing. We covered that. Cash flow. Uh, free cash flow total payment volume. Yeah, 5.2 billion free cash flow on a trailing 12 month basis. That's only going to go up. Got 403, 30 million active customer and merchant accounts. $1.5 trillion of total payment volume. 24 billion payment transaction. Nothing compares to this, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you, this is a beast. Now they've got a stable coin, which all these crypto people are saying is going to be a huge deal. I have no idea. I'd rather have it than not have it. I don't, you know, it's not in my model, but apparently that's going to be a big deal. And then you look at the business. It's so much more um, robust than you think about. 
at first glance, um, it's not just a PayPal that we know as consumers. They have huge enterprise business, huge lending business, huge buy now, pay, pay later, uh, crypto, everything that people could want. And he's going to package it so it's not so confusing into one value package. And he talks a lot about the credit card. The 3% cashback PayPal card is ripping right now. So they've got everything anyone could ever want, and they're going to just jam it down the customer's throat. Why? Because it's great for the customer, it's great for PayPal, and it's great for the owners. Uh, payment volume just keeps going up, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, if you think inflation is going to be a buck trend for the next three to five years, guess what that does? The nominal value, they get the same percentage on a greater and greater volume, even if units don't go up, uh, because that's what they get paid on is the ticket. Uh, not the margin, which is exciting. So uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. they talked a lot about Venmo, total payment volume. You can go through this. The transactions per active account went up dramatically. So existing customers are using it a lot more. Operating expenses declined 12%. They are slashing and burning, running an efficient, lean, mean, profit-making machine. Uh, you can see Gap EPS, free cash flow we covered. Capital allocation share repurchase machine is on tilt, and that's going to continue. He gets it. This guy knows how to run a multi-bagger, one of the greatest multi-baggers of all time. Let me just pull up the chart so you guys can get tuned in here because I am excited about this one, especially because everyone is despondent about it. This thing is going to be a beast, okay? So this is PayPal, okay? And it's just come off the mat, $50. Now it's $62. Here's what he did at Intuit. And his business was the grower, and he did it through acquisitions, and he did it through cutting costs and running an efficient thing. From While he was there running the small business unit, from $20 to $700. So what do you want to talk about? Five times seven, 35 bagger. Brack and Daryl only did a 26 bagger. And these are the guys running our big positions. Uh, it's pretty damn exciting. That's all I can tell you. So... Um, now I have no idea where I was, but we're gonna find it here. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so this was his first earnings call. You know, talks about how he's excited and everything, how it's a growth company, which is key because at these multiples, it looks like a value company, which is what got me interested. So he's gonna re accelerate growth. That's not even in my model. He doesn't even need to re-accelerate growth uh, for this thing to double. But if, God forbid he does that and we get multiple expansion. It's it, it, Look, uh, I'm energized. I'm more energized and have been more conviction and clarity than I expected over how we win. I mean, this guy says win every single minute. Growth vectors out there, higher velocity, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay. First, how do we differentiate in solving the most critical customer problem? Second, what are the unique growth vectors and how do we accelerate our impact for customers and shareholders? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Exactly. Oh, this is really interesting. He's like, we're not looking for answers. We know exactly what needs to be done. We must simply execute. Okay. And that's what this guy's doing. Growth outcomes. And what's important to these customers. Okay. Listen to this. Over 70% of the adult population has used PayPal in the past five years in the United States. Um, they also just launched the Venmo Teen account. Uh, and he talks about when you have a product that's a verb, I'm going to Venmo you. It's, it's like hugely, extremely valuable. I mean, what other tissues do you buy other than Kleenex? Um, over 25 million customers have used PayPal rewards in the last 12 months which he's talking about with the credit card, et cetera. So he's gonna tie these all together, simplify them. They got the stable coin, first regulated stable coin by a global payments company. It's PYUSD, connecting our PayPal and Venmo ecosystems together and creating one of the most robust peer-to-peer -peer networks in the world. Um, okay, 35 million merchant accounts. Ba, ba, ba. And where he made his money is in the small businesses, and that's what PayPal is all about. Uh, da, 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 we got that. They're using a ton of AI. They're using automating stuff, cutting a lot of jobs, a lot of slowness in the in the operation right now and overlap. He's cutting all that out, which is why the operating margin is 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 starting to improve. Uh, win 
And then for everyone that was worried about Braintree because of the lower margins, he goes, we can win in the market and take share with Braintree, serving the largest enterprises such as Adobe, Booking.com, DoorDash, Ticketmaster, and Uber. I mean, I use Uber so much every time I travel or I'm in the city, and that's all paying myself because Braintree has that business and I get a piece of the action. I'm going to use Uber more. Uh, you know, $450 billion in volume out of an estimated $4 trillion to $5 trillion of global large enterprise e-commerce. That's approximately 10% flowing through us. People think of PayPal, they think of the stupid little button on the website or the rinky-dink websites. Uh, you know, this thing is is the engine between behind 10% of the big businesses and they're gonna get more and more share with this guy. This guy got me so excited about what he's doing with the company. Uh, and that's not, that's not even why I got into it. That's one of the reasons, like we didn't even need all this. This guy is going to make it amazing. Uh, did, 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 did PayPal kind of three margin expansion in Braintree. That's what everyone was worried about. That's what he's focused on. Um, okay. High quality customer growth and okay, so this is his focus high quality customer growth and profitable revenue growth going forward. PayPal will be focused on generating real profit for the company. Unprofitable growth is counterproductive to the long term prospects of this or any other growth oriented company as management team will be guided by margin accretive revenue growth. Okay, so he's not going to do dumb uh dilutive acquisitions this guy knows about margin laser laser focused on operating leverage and making sure we manage our cost base with relentless attention and commitment cost based complex structure is slowing us down accelerate our revenue growth while reducing our expenses helping to further drive our operating leverage uh going to move at lightning speed and get there as quickly as possible this guy is on the move renewed energy excitement at paypal leading us forward uh ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay, so the active accounts declined by 2.8 million as we quote, continue to flush out low quality customers, predominantly in Latin America and Southeast Asia. As a reminder, we said this would be a year where we churn off lower quality activities and in which total accounts would decline. And that's exactly what they're doing. Anything that doesn't make them money, they're getting rid of it because they don't want to service it. So um, positioning ourselves for a return to growth in our customer base, Turning to volume growth, we reported total payment volume of 15% uh, growth in spot. We covered that. Da, 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 da. Okay. And by the way, for those of you who think this is, you know, monotonous, this is how you win. This is how you find the best investments. You look under every single rock. You Attention to detail is absolutely paramount to getting multi-baggers. They don't just fall on your lap and like, you just buy something because it's down and hope for the best. And you're going to find that it, those of you who listen into the AMA sections, we get one or two really great ones a week, but most of them are just nonsense that uh, are money losing, bad management, garbage things. And that's where people miss the point of bottom picking is because they're buying crappy things that are down versus buying good things that are just temporarily out of favor. And Buffett talked about that all the time, temporarily on the operating table, not dying. Um, Okay, just in for 10. Okay, so you can go through this on hedgefundtips.com. By the way, this is opinion, not advice. Go to hedgefundtips.com, click on terms. Um, okay, 75. We now expect approximately 75 basis points of margin expansion. We're slightly increasing our expectations for full year 2023 non gap EPS, which we now expect to approximately $4.98, representing 21% EPS growth from last year. This increase reflects the benefit of Q3 outperformance and changes to our tax rate assumption. In addition, we now expect free cash flow of 2023 to be at least 4.6 billion. Uh, we're working on plans to accelerate profitable growth. All right, question and answers. Uh, big surprise and margins. So the biggest, okay, so this guy asked him like, what surprised you the upside and downside? You've been here for four weeks, you barely found the coffee machine. He said, um, ubiquitous platform is globally recognized with PayPal. Venmo is a verb, and that's something that's tremendous in the U.S. and has opportunities beyond the U.S. Rewards, buy now, pay later, cashback cards, all those tremendous within our group. As I mentioned earlier, we have to put them together in a core value proposition, and that's something we're doing right now. Uh, we have a beachhead now with Braintree, which I'm really excited about. I think we've earned the right 
to now expand margin and make sure we're really pricing to value and ensuring that we're delivering what we need across the board. And then I think about the biggest surprise I really didn't think is around the data. Data that we have across this two-sided network allows us to do things that others just can't. Allows us to do things that others just can't. Personalized branded checkout. We can now recognize people that check out with our data and create an experience that is frictionless, that is personalized, that drives conversion for our merchants. We think we're just scratching the surface of the opportunity there. And so that is a big opportunity that gets me very excited. Uh, blah, blah, blah. That's based. Okay. Growth company, manage OpEx. Improve growth and driving profitable growth. Ah, this is very important uh, from the CFO. I really view Q3 as the low point, and we'd expect to see improvement in the profile in Q4. Reaccelerate profitable growth in the business. We expect to be able to do that. Uh, drive profitable growth. Sequential performance improvement over a number of quarters. We have enough levers at our disposal to be able to deliver on that. Pretty rare to be able to have an asset as powerful as Venmo. Becomes a verb. In language is a tremendous demographic. Teen Venmo. Why not baby Venmo? I mean, come on, babies have cell phones nowadays. All right. So uh, spending and managing money. Da, da, da. So there's just so much here. This this call is amazing. I wish I was able to do it earlier, but uh, profitable growth, true to north, and total focus. Uh, da, 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 da. Laying out our clear plan to win. Okay, so he ends it with wanting to win. That's the name of the game. All right, so here's a clip from April 20th with Liz Clayman. Uh, we had already owned it. Uh, on that day, it was trading at like $15. Here's what happened next. And today it was well over $30. I think it, uh, 32 or something. It was up 10% today. And I'm just like, all right, ring the register. Uh, it'll go higher, but you know, it's just uh, time value money. It's not going to be another 125% uh, gain in the next six months that I, that I'm pretty damn sure about. So, uh, we did that now we'll redeploy to what's cheap and uh, huge opportunities out there. Uh, fear and greed's getting a little high, except for the fact that when it gets this high in the beginning of multi-year moves, after you've consolidated for a few years, like after 15 and 16, by the way, hint, hint, China, uh, you had this multi-year run, year and a half run in the U.S. equities, uh, sentiment was already elevated. Same thing in 2020 after the huge move off the lows and that consolidation in the fall. Then you ran up again, same thing in early 2021, ran up again. I think this is more of a beginning of a multi-year breaking out of this cup and handle two-year consolidation, no gains on the indices since uh, early 2022, almost two years with no gains. Now we're just getting ready to, to lift off to that 5,600 target over the next couple of years. Uh, fear and greed is certainly getting higher. So we, you know, we're keeping an eye. Look, we rang the register on a bunch of stuff today. We got tons of cash uh, and everything else will move higher into the year-end chase. So ARC. Uh, top 30 weights in the ARC Innovation Fund. Uh, earnings revisions in the last 60 days. The earnings power of these stocks has risen by 70%. Yes, you heard me right, 70%. She's got a lot of biotech in there, ladies and gentlemen. So that is going to be, uh, so while everyone is, uh, uh, you know, pooping on that fund, they all want to buy oil and gas, which I think is probably ready to bounce, but uh, because why opinion follows trend, uh, cumulative earnings of these top 30 is down 17% in the last 60 days. So, um, you know, choose wisely. What can I tell you? Earnings growth of next year, the biggest earnings growers are going to be healthcare. You can't give away healthcare this year, uh, biotech's within that. Then communication services, uh, followed by infotech, consumer discretionary, et cetera. Um, but what does everyone want? You know, energy materials are going to be the garbage ones. So um, earnings estimates tick back up again, 246 for next year. They're, they were holding in strong. They dipped a little bit in October. Opinion followed trend. Now the market's going up. They're picking back up. Uh, and you see a big jump, 12% earnings growth. But the big story there is not just the earnings growth. It is the margin expansion, 70 basis points expected. CEOs were planning for a recession that never came in 2023. It actually came the first two quarters of 2022, which we've been saying for a year. And um, uh, so now they've got costs down, they're running efficient machines, productivity enhancements from AI or whatever buzzword you wanna use. 
and um, and top line's growing. So it's a good mix for next year. I think with that said, uh, the formal podcast is over. The Ask Me Anything question section starts now. If you want to stick around, here we go. Jason Patel, uh, Tom, how many activist investors were you ahead of in this cycle? LOL, so cool. Uh, CCI, Crown Castle, BF Corp, Disney, Advanced Auto Parts, I'm sure more. It's really impressive. It's becoming a foregone conclusion. <laughs> All right, no question there, but thank you for the kind words, Jason Patel. Avil Garcia, <clears throat> I've been watching for a couple of months. I'm a big supporter of your content. Thank you very much. I've never done one of these, but I figured I'll pitch in. I've been looking at PTLO. They've announced a big investment in growth for the next couple of years, and it's a solid business. All the restaurants I pass have consistent lines. Thoughts, I appreciate your time. PTLO, I don't know this one, but we're gonna learn it. Or at least take a quick look to start with. Okay, so PTLO, this thing IPO'd, it looks like it shot up to $55 after the IPO, and now it shot down to $14, it's trading at $16. Let's take a look at the numbers. The thing I don't love about these, I like to be in businesses that have been through many cycles, but let's take a look and see what we got here. Um, so first and foremost, uh, does casual quick serve restaurants in the United States to Chicago style hot dogs. Okay, there you go. And Italian beef sandwiches, char grilled burgers, chopped salads, crinkle cut, French fries, homemade chocolate cakes and chocolate shakes. I think I'm a buyer of the product and not the stock, but let's just see if I can be convinced otherwise. Um, why does this always happen? Let's see, control minus, minus, minus. No, that's not gonna work, control zero. So I gotta just make this smaller. There we go. That wasn't so hard. Okay, same thing every Ask Me Anything question. One of these weeks I'll get it right. Okay, maybe by episode 300. All right, so um, we only got a few years of data. Uh, they dropped obviously during COVID, they picked back up, they're back into growth. Solid operating income. They're okay, making a little bit of money. So this is a growth story. I mean, this, uh, they got 12 million of cash on their balance sheet. Let's see, what do they have in terms of debt? $287 million. All right, what are they doing in terms of cash from operations is okay. Free cash flow, negative. Low return on capital. Uh, I don't know. I think I got to try their hot dogs before I do anything. But uh, leave in all seriousness, I think what you have here, um, Aviel is you have a trade at best. This is not a super high quality business. You'd really have to have some edge on the growth plans and on management's track record of delivering and the product, et cetera. The products sound right up my alley, I gotta be honest with you. And the stock is down, you know, 65%. I like that too. Uh, they are inflecting into profitability. That's also good. Their balance sheet, I'm not thrilled with, um, but I'd have to know the product better. So. Uh, based on the numbers, because there aren't enough decades of them, I like companies with decades of data and lots of cycles I can analyze. Um, I would say uh, trade at best, worth exploring, but not the type of business we do. As you listen more and more, Abiel, you'll get a better understanding 
for the businesses that we do. And we like established boring season, free cash flowing businesses uh, with durable moats. Uh, and this is just a little too speculative for what we do. That does not mean it won't work. And I think you may be onto something. I can't wait to try those Chicago dogs and change my mind. Bob Johnson, in honor of Charlie Munger's passing, Charlie talked about how going public with a position can create a bias where one defends a position. Would love to get your advice and perspective on how you thread these choppy waters. Thanks, Bob. So we're going to get the, uh, these are all from like last Thursday when I think uh, Bob owes $69. Opinion follows trends. So I got like four Baba things, all these nervous, angry people. But here's the deal. Um, first off, I acknowledge you for sending in the question, Bob, because I'm sure a lot of people have the same question. Um, you know, Charlie Munger bought Alibaba at $225 with double leverage. So, um, you know, and because he used leverage out of the gate, he couldn't buy down and even bring down his basis and even get it to, you know, it would be the, it's, it's not dissimilar from the meta trade. I mean, this thing, you know, the meta trade, there were a lot of people who bought meta. We caught, we covered this last week, you know, dropped from whatever, 350 uh, down to 150. And a lot of people bought at 150 and it was a good value at 150. But when it dropped to 88, they uh, they puked out at the bottom. They they lost their courage, and then they didn't have, or they did it on leverage at 150, and didn't have dry powder to average in, so they could be down at 110 basis, even if it went down to 80 dollars against them. And now it's at at 327 dollars or wherever it is. So the people who bought, that's what the Klarman quote was all about at the beginning of the podcast. Uh, the people who bought at um, at um, 150 made double in less than in, in just about a year if they stuck with it and they made more than that maybe triple if they bought in the hole when it moved against them like we did with range resources like we've done with baba uh like we've done with many of them i mean what's what's served up in the last two weeks and what served up last fall at 58 dollars, we were able to get a ton at 61 and then a ton between 60 nine and change and 73 and 75 in the last two weeks. I mean, you don't get opportunities like that. And when it, when it rain, you know, when it rains manna from heaven, you got to pull out the bucket, not the thimble. And that's what we were able to do. And it wasn't that we were going above our maximum weight position. The weight had gotten so small because everything else in the portfolio went up huge that Baba became such a small position. I said, I got to bring this back up to uh, a serious size position because this is a serious size opportunity. So that's the story there. Um, uh, the thing about going public in the position, that's like a, that's for traders and gamblers. I mean, I'm buying a business that's growing their free cash flow. If they gr if they stop growing their free cash flow and they just have negative prints over and over, then, then the thesis has changed. The business has changed. I changed my mind. But these people that say, oh, I'm going long this and they don't even know why they own it. That's why they have to change their mind because they have no reason, they have no clue why they own it to start with. So it goes against them. They don't know why it's going against them and they puke in the hole because they never knew why they owned it to start with. And, you know, thank God those people exist or I'd be out of a job. Like those are the people I buy from. So uh, there we go. Nate Kelsey, uh, turn around Tom. <laughs> You've highlighted many companies that have been crushed by inventory gloves from supply chain problems, blah, blah, blah. High okay, so he writes a very nice question with a million words. It's, it's gonna take us till tomorrow to read his whole thing. He's asking about Haynes Brands. We did Haynes Brands about a month ago. I took a pass. Uh, he's making a case that the debt's gonna be paid off. Uh, look, uh, they're generating enough free cash. I I think you'll be okay with this. Why not, why not buy the debt? See what the bonds are doing because if the bonds are down 50%, let's say you're going to put a million dollars into the position, bonds are trading at 50%. Why not do 500,000 in the bonds and do 500,000 in the equity? So if you're wrong and it goes bankrupt, at least you get 100% of your money out. You'll be money good with the bonds provided they're fully secured and their assets to liquidate. And then if and then if you're right, you got the, you know, you got a double on the bonds. And you probably have a five bagger on the stock with a lot less risk. That's the way I would play this. Uh, but I won't play it because I don't like the business, uh, even though I think the trade's going to work. So let's just take a quick look here. And um, 
this has always been a garbage business, by the way. So, all right, so the free cash flow positive, they're, they're starting to inflect. Probably an inventory, yeah, inventory story. Uh, revenues have just gone nowhere for 10 years. This is why I said I didn't want it the last time, um, because it's just like, it's like a dead annuity. This, this is what they call a cigar butt. This is what Buffett got away from. Munger talked him into buying higher quality businesses uh, with higher returns on capital, because basically your return in the stock is gonna be the average, of your return on invested capital over the long period of time. And when it diverges from the uh, return on invested capital for a long period of time, that's when you get these doubles and triples. And that's what we do all day long. Um, uh, but a lot of people get sucked into the vortex of um, buying something just because the price is down versus buying a good business. And uh, you know this has historically, Let me take a look at the balance sheet here. I mean, I think this is going to work. I'm not gonna participate. So I think you did okay work here, Nate, and I think you got a pretty good pick, but there's so many better opportunities, not because they'll go up more than Haynes, because if Haynes works, it'll go up a lot, but it, if it doesn't work and you don't have the bonds, uh, you're gonna get bub kiss. So that said, rates are coming down, refinancing's gonna open, so, all right, I'm, I'm kind of like convincing myself here. Um, you know, a lot of this is instinct also from just seeing these things over the years through cycles. Um, how much debt? Yeah, $3 billion of debt. Hundred ninety of cash. So you just have to see when everything matures, what's the cost of capital, what's their plan to, to generate free cash flow, do they have enough to service the debt? I mean, this is, a, all you have to get comfortable with here is whether it goes bankrupt or not. Let me see if you talked about this. Assuming uh, rates. First debt maturity is November, 2026, giving them time to refinance. Okay, generate 450 million in free cash flow, pay down 400. Reduced inventory by 600 million, sold through old inventory. Um, huh. I don't know, Nate, I'm stuck on this one. I think you're on the right track. I see what you're getting at here. I would just, here's what I would do. I, I, I see by your analysis, you're gonna wind up doing this trade. And if you are gonna do this trade, what I would do is do 50% of the debt if it's trading at, at least at a 40% discount to par. Um, so bet on the refinancing. And then, you know, if it's, if it's down 40% by, you know, 600,000 in debt and 400,000 in stock, the stock you'll get a five bagger on, the debt you'll get, you know, whatever, 80 to 100% you'll collect a little um, uh, high yield in the meantime while you wait, and at least you're covered if they actually do go BK. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this one's kind of interesting. I, I, I would, it's not a good enough business where I'd ever put client money in it, but like if you're just risking with your PA, you know, maybe you take a flyer on it. Uh, I think it's interesting. I think you did good work, good contribution. Laura, uh, oh, okay. that's for investing. Tila Tap. Um, two questions. I know you have a small position in ASOS. Why didn't you buy four Farfetch currently on the brink of bankruptcy? But interesting to know why you didn't choose them. Because they had no history of return on invested capital. They were a startup. I couldn't analyze their operations through cycles. Um, ASOS had a moat through many cycles. They destroyed the moat. They brought in this suit from McKinsey to fix it. Um, I think it's a good enough business that even if he works overtime, he's not going to be able to completely destroy it. And God forbid he actually fixes it, then you got a super multi bagger. But again, he hasn't shown me anything where I want to lean in. But I've got enough that you know it'll it'll be a, a nice trade if it works. 
And if he does some constructive things, it might be something I lean into and own for a long time. Uh, but Farfetch is just, you know, uh, it was a one hit wonder from, from COVID and uh, no history, just a me too product. Like um, what's that one uh, in the U S with it that started with an S uh, wasn't the real real. It was like, they'd send stuff to women every month. Um, anyway, whatever, there you go. No one remembers. Everyone knew what it was in 2021. Rasa R. Thoughts on Siri, oh, okay, uh, Liberty Media, Siri merger, maybe grossly undervalued. Look, Sirius has been grossly undervalued for decades. Um, I don't think that's gonna change. Every value guy has looked at it, never works. So you know, people listen on their um, mobile devices. They listen to hedge fund tips with Tom Hayes. They don't listen to Howard Stern anymore. So uh, let's just take a look here. Of late, you know, the big winner in uh, John Malone companies has just been John Malone, no one else. So I'm going to just, you know, he's a legend. He's done great things throughout his career. But of late, everything's just been, a, you know, it's been a complete loser for three, four years. So uh, let's see. The problem with this business, Rasa, and your objective analysis is correct. It's just, it's been cheap forever. It's a low quality dying business. And this is a cigar, cigar butt where you're trying to get the one last puff. This is not a growth business. This is not really something you want. It'll work probably for a trade. So what is it? Uh, XMA L. Yeah, look, it's going to work higher as a trade Rasa, more likely than not, but I just, I, I don't really want to own that business. Uh, Ronan Bitten, um, thank you for all your hard work. Like your opinion on Pfizer. I, you know, someone asked this a few weeks ago when it was, um, I think 31. And I said, nah, not yet. If it gets in the low 20s, I might be interested. I, you know, the interesting thing about this is they have the same similar technologies to Moderna. And Moderna was out today saying they're going to cure cancer uh, and they might, by the way. Um, but we'll participate through our biotech exposure. Um, the thing about Pfizer was the patent cliff and then they're, they guided that their C-Gen acquisition or when their acquisition wasn't as accretive as they thought it would be. Um, I mean, it's getting cheap enough and the dividend is, is uh, pays you a lot while you wait. But if I recall, it's got a lot of deceleration before they re-accelerate. Re I mean, it's, um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they needed that uh, oral weight loss drug. They'll probably wind up getting one, but uh, that was a hit to the stock. They need something new. They need to buy something or do something that's going to move the needle. Um, so far, they haven't. 
Where is uh, this is the forward expectations here? So they're expecting to get back to 350 by 2025. I got my eye on it. I wasn't tempted to do anything today. Although we have some cash now from taking profits on Intel and Bernardo. I'll, I'll tell you one thing, Ronan. I, I mean, I think if you buy it here and you have a three to five year view, you're gonna make 5% a year. Uh, and you'll probably have, I, I'd like to buy it under 25, somewhere between 20 and 25. If I can do that, it would get more interesting, but I just don't see any catalyst for this. And when things aren't perfectly clear to me, I just, I just pass. So. In the low 20s, I've got to revisit it just because I have to. But at this level, I just it could could perfectly turn. I just think it's there's so many better places to put money that have growth stories that have turnaround catalysts in place. This thing's not showing me anything yet, um, so I'm gonna pass. But I think your instinct is correct. I just want to see it a bit lower. All right, turnaround Tom from Stephen. Frampton, uh, they say only the greats can nickname themselves and fill in just used yours on TV. Are you Kobe Bryant, AKA the self-proclaimed black mamba of investment? I, I don't know, I've never been called a black mamba, but I can tell you one thing. Um, I wish I'd come up with it. A friend actually called me, what do you turn around Tom? So I was like, oh, that's pretty catchy. Nonetheless, uh, my other question is about how so many people can be wrong. Philly Yin laid it out pretty well. Media was bearish, hedge fund were bearish, everybody. How can so many people who proclaim to do this for a living be wrong? For the Dow to reach all-time highs, plenty of people must be buying the stocks, though. For someone new to the markets like me, it's pretty mind-bending. Wondering if you can comment on this. Well, Steven, stick around, because if you haven't been with us for the last two, three, four years, uh, you know that the kind of guiding light of this is opinion follows trend and people, you know, investors, are, it's just human beings are lemmings. They, they chase what goes up, they puke out what goes down because they don't know what they own. So when, you know, Wall Street is the only store in the world that when they hold a clearance sale, everyone runs out of the store. You put garbage trinkets on sale at Walmart and people are beating themselves up awaiting to get in on Black Friday and you put the highest quality cash generative growing businesses on sale, mark down 50%, 75%. You know, in Wall Street, the bigger the discount, the more people run away. <laughs> in Walmart, the bigger the discount, the more people run towards. I guess it's, it goes to show you, uh, people don't wanna see treasures marked down, they wanna see trinkets marked down, but that's just human nature. Opinion follows trend, that will never change. You'll get better and better in discerning between trinket and treasure. That's where all the money is made. And that takes years of experience, but you can probably shorten your learning curve quite a bit by uh, listening to people who have that experience. So uh, Henry Gill, uh, your teachings have helped me more than you will ever know. Thank you, Henry, I appreciate that. Could you please take a look at Borg Warner? The stock appears to have double bottomed at approximately 3250 with good free cash flow. Imminent spinoff to uh, some of its legacy uh, ICE. I don't know. I like Cooper Standard. <laughs> Let's see. Borg Warner. I looked at Borg Warner when I was looking at Cooper Standard. Um, you know, one's up 3x, one's up 30%. So that tells you everything you need to know about Borg Warner. Uh, I don't buy based on chart patterns. Um, I think this is gonna do fine. I, I don't know if they do more of the uh, used car or a new car. Let's just see if I pulled this, this sheet here. Yeah, Borg Warner, supplier hire for automotive powertrain application, OEMs, 
Where we are, manual automatic torque, 40 counted for 13 Volkswagen. I think I think this one's going to be okay on the same basis as Cooper Standard, but I don't think it has the same type of leverage um, or upside. So why take a similar amount of risk? Because all you're really betting is what is industry production going to be and who's got the most operating leverage to take advantage of it. Um, You know, this was basically a less risk, much less reward play to put in place in 2022 when we did Cooper Standard. Um, and that's not what we wanted. We wanted the Charlie Munger trade where he took 10 million, turned it into 80 million, and then put the 80 million in China, turned it into a half a billion uh, in a handful of years. That's the trade we wanted. and. Um, that's what we did. So this is, this looks fine. It's kind of a snoozer. I mean, you, you probably get a double over the next three years. So that's great. I mean, I think you found a nice business at a decent price. Um, good work. John Weller, have enjoyed learning your investor techniques, much happier since avoiding the speculator and swing trading approaches. Can you explain, educate a bit more when to leave a stock? Uh, exited fast at 60, but maybe regretting this. I'm still in Boeing, so it rise to 220, been a rough ride to 180, now rising back to 240. Boeing seems like a forever hold, but very interested in your thoughts on these two companies of when to exit. You have to know when you're getting out before you get in. We knew when we were getting out of Intel on the basis of the PC business, uh, and we've even talked about it, uh, and then what we would hold for the flyer business of the Manana Foundry AI change the world business. So we kept a little on for that. Same thing with uh, Vornado. We got in at a 60% discount to book and we sold at book. So yeah, it'll trade above book. Uh, the pendulum swings uh, aggressive on both sides, but you know, you also have IRR and uh, we got that return in such a short period of time and the options juiced the return so much that we just didn't want to be pigs. We want to find other things that could triple in such a short period of time. So um, double and triple in case of the options. So um, the answer to your question is, First off, you have to know what you're doing. So start by reading The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. Understand how to discount cash flows, do security analysis is a good place to start. Seth Klarman, margin of safety. It's not an easy fix. You don't get conviction to bet against the crowd and stick with it when they're all laughing and then wind up with doubles and triples. They don't give away multi-baggers for free. I, I've said that since day one. If you don't do your work, I mean, I know the businesses I own. I know what I would be willing to pay and what they would garner in the par in the private markets. That's why I love public markets so much because the private markets would never offer up the prices that the public market that is is based on irrational exuberance and uh, depressed despondency from time to time. Uh, the prices that they'll trade these same assets where the cash flows are relatively steady on a, on a predefined growth trend for the type of high quality moated businesses that we buy. So as far as fast and all, um, you know, if you don't, if you don't know where fair value is before you get in based on your analysis of the cat discounted cash flow of the earnings growth of the cash flow growth of the multiple uh and you're just buying on the basis of momentum i would not even invest i would either outsource to someone who knows what they're doing or spend three years and learn learn to do what you're doing um that's not a two minute ask me anything answer but there's not one company we buy that we don't know where we're exiting and the only thing that will change that is if the fundamentals get dramatically better than what we expected when we got in. And that's few and far between. Usually the fundamentals didn't get that bad for the price to go down 65%, and they don't get that much better for the price to go up double. If you look at the Microsoft example, where the thing traded sideways 
uh, from uh, for seven years, Bomber's cash flow growth was actually greater in percentage terms when the stock did zero over seven years than when uh, Satya did for the next seven years and the stock was up 1500%. So it's a coiled spring and sooner in the short term, things trade on emotion. In the long term, they trade on fundamentals. As far as Boeing be a hold forever, Boeing is not a hold forever. Boeing's a cyclical business, okay? And we've, we're just coming out of the cycle. Probably works its way higher, but uh, uh, and maybe back up to all-time highs. But uh, this is probably not one I would hold forever. Uh, they do have a duopoly, so there is a sense of moat. But you have that China provider coming on. Uh, but I, you know, look, I I think this is going to work higher. But this is not a buy and hold forever. This is not a super high quality. It just happens to be a duopoly, so. It works through cycles if you buy in the down cycle, like 2020, or you got another bite at the apple last year when everyone was just selling everything for no reason. Um, and those are the times to buy it. But those are trades just like Vernado is a trade. Vernado is not a hold forever. Intel's not a hold forever. Although this last piece might be a hold for some time if they get it right. Uh, but, you know, um, that's that. So that's that. Jao Viegas, great content as always, keep it coming. Beauty of an auction-driven market is emotions play an important role and people overreact to the upside, more importantly the downside. Bob is clearly the latter. By the way, any thoughts on a value play on Paramount? We did Paramount a couple weeks ago. We said it was a trade. I'm not gonna do it again. It's a trade based on being sold. Um, the balance sheet is garbage, but as rates come down, it's better. There is value there. Uh, so it's doubled since then. Not doubled. It's up fifty percent. Probably goes up a little more. I don't see anyone paying more than twenty-five or thirty dollars for this, but I'm welcome to be proven wrong. And if they hold it, then maybe over the next five or ten years, if they can refinance the debt, this thing can work its way back up to fifty or sixty. Um, so I would say it's a trade. It's not a great business, and then it's a trade that'll probably work. Julian Glock. Um, Okay, wanted to ask whether Alibaba, remember all the Alibaba questions that came in last week when everyone was despondent. I want to ask whether Alibaba is really compatible to US Western stocks. Can we apply the same rules for this company as the fantastic fundamentals valuations don't seem to matter much, unfortunately. Is the growth, um, is the growth of any worth the stock not taking off due to Chinese political and economic issues? As long as those issues are prevalent, Baba seems not to move up properly. American companies don't come with the baggage, therefore, the, isn't the risk higher? Yeah, if you believe that. But if you actually believe you're buying a high quality asset when it's out of favor, uh, you tune out the noise. And you got the same noise going now with the CCP and all this BS and capital flight that you had when institutions were fleeing right here in 2015 and 16. I showed you on my cell phone. It's on my Twitter account, at Hedge Fund Tips. Where the hell is this thing? All right, there, same outflows. This is the result. Stock was here, same nonsense that you're talking about. And next thing you know, the thing was up from 60 or $70 up to $300. First to 200, then it checked back, take out the Wee Sisters, then up to $300. And uh, the fundamentals are much better this time. So something will change when, it, when everyone least expect it. It'll start running up. No one will believe it. Everyone will crowd in. Uh, the talking heads will be all over it at $250. They won't be able to get enough. This is a great growth story. China is back, blah, blah, blah. And that's when we will be laying off to never be again ever in China because they're going to hit a demographic cliff in about four to five years ago, four to five years from now, and they're going to be the next Japan and they're absolutely toast. But between now and then, with the large part of their population at 34, the next three to five to six years is going to be a beast of a growth. And as much as Xi tries full time to destroy that, he won't be able to because there's tailwinds. They're just coming out of what was a complete heart attack. And the, the marathoner can't run the marathon two weeks after the heart attack. They opened the country 11 months ago. It's getting better. But, uh, you know, there's some hiccups and um, those hiccups will be worked out. And this is the perfect shake out the last week sisters, which is why we lean the hell in in the last week, week and a half. And uh, this is gonna be another range resource to be a huge multi-bagger over years. And, um, uh, and to answer your question is, if that's what's holding the stock back, 
then why didn't it hold the stock back in 2015 and 16 when all the headlines were the same and China was the end of the world in China and then all of a sudden you had a multi-bagger? And why wasn't it a problem when Xi was the same leader in 2015-16 and when everyone was getting the hell out of China in 2015 and 16 because it was uninvestable and all the same BS and you can look them all up on Google, it's the same thing over and over again. So you can say this time's different and maybe you'll be right and I'll run that risk, but you know, since day one, I've always had one hard and fast rule. If any one of my positions went to zero, would I live in another day? And with Bob, it could go to zero tomorrow and I'd still have a great year in 2023. And, uh, and it could happen in 2024, because if I knew for certain everything about everything, I could just put 100% of my money double levered in one stock like Charlie Munger did at 225 and he got his face ripped off. I would never do that. Uh, maybe that's why Charlie's a billionaire. He was make, willing to take those big swings, but I wanna live to see another day and I'm perfectly happy doubling every few years versus uh, trying to double overnight. And, um, you know, that's just me. So, uh, you know, there's always things you don't know that you don't know. But for my money, uh, you know, it's funny. I was telling a friend, I said, you know, those eight or 12 other companies that have all just been ripping higher in the last couple of months and with the option stuff, you know, the stocks are up, you know, 50%, 100%, the options are up multiples. I said, not one of them is as good of a business at a good price as Alibaba. Not one company in my portfolio is a better investment inside of my framework. They all fit the framework. That's why they're all working. But um, Baba is 100 times better business at 100 times better price. So I just wait patiently while everyone, you know, types up all this stuff and gets all upset and emotional. I, you know, I just wait. And uh, as everything else goes up, I get more money. And when Baba pukes out to 65, I'll buy more, um, maybe it won't, but, um, uh, and then all of a sudden it's gonna be 150 and then it's gonna be 200. And we're just gonna say, oh, Tom, you were so smart. No, I wasn't so smart. I just bought a great business at a good price. I knew what I owned. I already know where I'm getting out before I get in. Uh, and uh, that's that. And you know, um, the guys who bought Meta at 150 and puked it out at 80 when they would have had a double by now, even if they didn't buy more down at 80, which they should have, and then they would have had a hundred hundred dollars or a hundred and five dollar basis, and then they'd have a triple now that it's at 327. I can't help those people because they didn't know why they bought it, so they didn't know why they sold it. And if anything that I'm trying to teach you is helpful, uh, is how to understand what you own. And once you own high quality, which is why we don't go for these businesses that have two years of financials, how the hell can you know what you own? You haven't seen it operate through, through cycles. It could be a leveraged model that works like crazy when money's free and then you hit one hiccup and the guy goes over the handlebars down the hill and he's toast. All his front teeth are out, his nose is disjointed, he's never gonna recover. So uh, we wanna see ones that have been hit by linebackers two or three times in the last couple of decades how did they, did they get up? Did they play another game? Did they go on to win a Super Bowl? Is it such a good business that they're gonna win another, another Super Bowl? And if I've got another Super Bowl prospector that's building the new roster with a Shane O'Kelly, with a Bracken Darrell, you know, with a Joe Sy, you know, God forbid, uh, then so be it. And, uh, and that's what we do over and over. And I think you've seen enough multi-baggers in the last 12 months to know that it works. And, um, and it's gonna to continue to work. And if you think the seeds that we planted in 2022, uh, blossoming in 2023 have been amazing, wait till you see the seeds that we planted in 2023, how they blossom in 2024. So with that said, uh, we'll be back next week, but uh, same time, same place. For those of you celebrating holidays right now, happy holidays. For those of you who have them coming, Merry Christmas, uh, but we'll see you before then. And in the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.